recording is a little different for me because a lot of it is going to come from my notes, which means I've got to be stationary, and for me that's kind of a tough thing to do. But I felt that it was an important message, so some of it I want to read to you and make sure that I get exactly right what God wants me to share with you. I want to start out by telling you a little bit about how I arrived at this message or how God gave me the idea for this message. Um, my family comes to church a lot. You guys have met most of my family. This young man here that comes with our family a lot, this is my daughter's boyfriend. His name is Alton. Um, now, that's not the way he pronounces his name, but since most of you have my accent, his name is Alton. <laughs> By the way, Alton accepted Christ yesterday, and we took him immediately down to Lake Erie and got him baptized. A couple weeks back, he's at the house, and I'm sharing the Bible with him. We're talking about Jesus. And he's getting really excited about it. I can see the excitement, and we're talking, and we're kicking ideas back and forth. And he says, I've got a great idea for a sermon. And I admit when he said it, I thought, this is going to be horrible. <laughs> but I saw the excitement, so I said, go ahead, lay it on me. Let's hear what your idea is. And he said, what you ought to do is have everybody keep facing the front, but you should walk all the way to the back of the church. And then you should tell them, keep looking at the front. Now, I knew this was a horrible idea. But I had to ask, why on earth would I want to do that? And he said, that way, their focus is on the cross. Amen. That way, their focus is on the cross. Amen. And I thought, wow, what a smart kid. That way, their focus is on the cross. Now, many of you guys know, I've talked to some of you, my education is in history, it's in architecture, and it's in religion. So I am most comfortable if you put me in a 200-year-old church. I love the moldings, I love the buildings. So I wanted to share something with you about that. If you go into an old church or an old library where they have the great big chandeliers, on the ceiling above the chandeliers, you will see molded rings going around those chandeliers. Now, in some cases, those moldings are very decorative. They're very carved. In some cases, they're just plain and simple. Sometimes they've been painted. They've had gold overlay on them. Now, that is a smoke ring. That catches the smoke and soot from the old chandeliers when they had candles. And it would trap the smoke and soot so it wouldn't spread all over the ceiling and walls. They would later clean those rings out, and the ceiling still looks brand new. But in more recent years, we discover electricity. We hang electric chandeliers there. Now, those electric chandeliers don't need the smoke rings, but they keep them on the ceiling as they install the new ones. Over the years, people forget what those rings are for. They become a decoration. Nowadays, if you go into Denny's or anywhere, a new library, anywhere that they hang those chandeliers, you still see those smoke rings. They just think they're a decoration. They've lost touch with what those rings do. Now, folks, I tell you all that because in America today, this cross has become a decoration. We see it all over the roadsides. We see it on the streets. You see gang members that have them tattooed on their faces. Some of you guys that have spent time in the bars before you got saved, I believe every bartender in America has a little gold cross around his neck. They have become a decoration. So my message this morning, I want to share with you why I feel that this is more than a decoration, why it is so important to us, and I'd like to do that using Christ's words from the cross. Now, as Jesus is on the cross, he gives us seven statements. The first one that I'm going to read is from Luke 23, verses 33 through 35. Luke 23, 33 through 35. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, where they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for no, they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And
and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. Now I want to start off by asking the question, who is it that Jesus is talking to? Now clearly, he's asking forgiveness on the Roman soldiers who had just crucified him, but they may be the least guilty amongst the group. They're just following orders. If they don't crucify him, they get to join him. They're just following orders. Surely as he's there, he can look out and he can see the teachers, he can see the priests, he can see the disciple who, uh, who abandoned him, who denied him, he can see the one who turned him over to these priests and these men to be crucified. But the Bible teaches us that sin put Jesus on that cross. Amen. Amen. So if the question is, who crucified him? I did. Right. And you did. Yeah. Every time we commit sin, we have a hammer in one hand and we have a nail in another. He was crucified for our sin. But Christ's words from this cross are not words of blame. They're not words of accusation. They are words of forgiveness Amen. to the priests, to the soldiers, to you and I. In advance of our sin, we were forgiven of those sins. Guys, there is forgiveness, and it is found at the cross. Amen. Amen. Now, Luke 23, 39 through 43. And one of the malefactors which were, with, which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into, thou, in, into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now, Jesus is crucified amongst two thieves. This is an answer to prophecy. Isaiah 50, let's see. Isaiah 53, 12 tells us that he was numbered with the transgressors. This is an answer to prophecy. But as Jesus is being crucified, something about him is different. One of these men sees that as he should be yelling and screaming back at these people, he's forgiving them. Something begins to dawn on this one thief. That conviction begins to happen in his heart. He begins to realize something is going on here that is sort of over my head. And as they begin to rail, and even the other thief starts to taunt him, he finally can't take it anymore. And he says, stop. You've got to stop what you're doing. This is a good man. We deserve what we've got. He does not. This is a good man. And this is when he finally screams out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, if the first words are about salvation or forgiveness for the whole world, these words are about the simple salvation for one lost soul. How important one lost person is to the Lord. The Bible says when one sinner repents, all the angels and angels in heaven Amen. rejoice over that Amen. sinner. Amen. Now, this also shows something else to us. Jesus answered this man's prayer with Today you will be with me in paradise. He accepts that prayer. Guys, salvation is so simple. It's such a simple thing. In the world today, we like to add the affairs of man to salvation. This man's dying on the cross. There is no time for ceremony. There is no time for baptism. There is no time to learn a special handshake and join a church. He asks for salvation. He repents. Jesus gives it to him. The end. Amen. That's how simple salvation is. Amen. Now, guys, I also want to point out there are two thieves on that cross. When the time comes for repentance or rebellion, one chooses repentance, the other chooses rebellion. Now, the reason I point this out, folks, a lot of times, People will say, I I'll make a deathbed confession. I'll live my whole life, and then there at the end, I'll slide 
survival instinct is so strong that when you close your eyes for the last time, you're still going to be thinking, I can get out of this. I can get out of this. That's that rebellion talking. That's that rebellion in your heart saying, you're fine. You are the Lord of the world. And it's not true. If you're waiting for that deathbed confession, confession folks, it's not going to come. That's right, bro. Now, I also point this out. A lot of people will say, I don't see, Jim, I don't believe that God of love would actually send people to hell. Folks, the God of love can't believe that people keep choosing to go to hell after the sacrifice that he made on their behalf. Guys, there is salvation and it's to be found at the cross. Now guys, the next one I'm going to read to you. This is from John chapter 19 verse 25 and 27. 25 through 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Guys, I, I want you to think about what this is like for Mary to watch her firstborn son die this bloody, brutal death. Um, the suffering that she must have felt as she watched this happen, knowing that she can't do anything about it. These words from the cross to Jesus, he calls her woman instead of mother. He's separating himself from her. He's not really going to help her suffering, but he is using love to allow her to see him, not as her son, but as her Lord, as her Savior. It's her sin that he's dying for as well. He starts off with woman so that he can separate himself from her. This he does out of love. But guys, the awesome part of this, the part that I love about this, he says, Behold thy son, behold thy mother. Jesus rebuilds families, and he does it with love. We all have family members that we've lost touch with, that we've separated ourselves from for one reason or another. There's an old saying, you always hurt the ones you love. That's because if you didn't love each other, it wouldn't hurt. Jesus can rebuild families Amen. with love. Amen. Amen. Folks, there's love to be found at this cross. Now, you guys will follow with me again. Matthew 27, verses 45 through 46. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus had to bear the sins of the world. If you read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made to be sin. And God had to turn away from him. He had to experience this alone. Just like an unrepentant sinner has to be separated from God, Jesus had to be separated from God in a, as an atonement for our sin. Now, guys, I also want to point this out. This is what God's plan. This is what Jesus was sent here to do. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God 
is repeated by Stephen when he is shown in the first uh, second chapter of Acts, shortly in the beginning of Acts. This is also repeated several times by early Christian martyrs. Something along these lines, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. This is such a beautiful thing. Because this speaks of security. This is security in the knowledge that death has no sting. This is security in the hands of the know that you are in God's hands. Death has no hold on you. When he takes the victory, he takes the victory over death, over fear, over sin, over Satan. There is security in the knowledge that when you die, you get to spend eternity in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. I told many of you, when my father passed away, I didn't say goodbye. I said, I will see you later. Amen. Big smile on his face. Amen. Amen. Security. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear life. We are in God. Sins. 